Morning, church. Today, we want to preach on witnessing in a hostile environment, and naturally, your mind drifts to a remote corner around the globe, which is lesser known, with a very anti-Christian, uh, anti-church uh, people uh, trying to make it difficult for missionaries and the gospel of Jesus Christ to be shared in that community. But think again, actually, it is in your backyard. Uh, not only there are different parts of the world where people ha- are very hostile to the gospel, but within our own country, within our own backyard, we are experiencing more and more of that, where the public expression of Christian greetings and Christian uh, symbols and Christian signs are being taken down one by one, where Merry Christmas was not well received. Uh, Happy Holiday is a better term for other people who are anti-Christians. Where the cross, in fact, wearing around your neck may be offensive to some people in some company require you to take it down. As one employee of a company who was in the orientation of new employees were told by the supervisor, please take away your cross because it can be offensive to our new employees. And she fought her way, she kept her cross as an expression of her faith. You know, the world is trying to squeeze the church and try to push Christians back to the church, the four walls of the church building, and say, express it within the four walls of the church building, but don't go beyond that. As if faith, belief, convictions can be confined in a box. As if you can confine that within a certain perimeter and express it only there, and when you leave that place, then you can just pluck it out and say, okay, I'll see you next week. I'll express my Christian faith next week. They totally misunderstand the Christian faith because it's everything. It is our everything. It is our value. It defines who we are in Christ. And we see more and more of that in our backyards where cross that line up on cemeteries of unknown soldiers and heroic soldiers who fought for our country were asked to take down because that is a uh, merling the line of the separation of the church and state. In some states, they were doing that, or at least attempt to do that. So when I say witness in a hostile environment, my dear brothers and sisters, It is real. It is increasingly pushing back at the church and say, go back to your church. Go back to your home. Don't tell me about Christian faith. Don't show me all the symbols that you Christians like to show. Don't greet me with your Christian greetings. We don't want to hear about that, but do it in your quiet space, in your private space. So in some way, this passage is relevant to us today. It is a forewarning for us today. It is reminding us how to face a hostile environment as Christians. So today, as we turn to Acts chapter 21, all the way to chapter 22, 29, we have a long passage. And I'll do my best to preach through that passage and explain that passage uh, within the time confined. But when I was in the Mandarin service, I struggled with that. I went over time. Uh, So I would do another approach. Uh, When I was in Mandarin, I was just explaining the text, applying, explaining, applying. I didn't get it through. It was too hard. So now I would just read through it. And then I would just take up the text. I think that will help me and you as well. Then we can finish the sermon within the time frame. So I will divide that into two sections. The first section will be 21 verses 27 to 40. Okay, if you have the Bible, please turn to it uh, because we are preaching the Bible. So don't look at me, but look at your Bible. Look at your your cell phone and the Bibles in the cell phone. Okay, Acts 21, verses 27 to 40. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is a man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, 
the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came out and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he has done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn of the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptians then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motion with his hand to the people and when there was a great hush he addressed them in the hebrew language saying and then we'll touch on that on the next part in the first section here we're seeing paul was falsely accused by a very hostile audience we know when you are in a hostile environment any excuse can be used to purge the enemy and this is what happened because paul was falsely accused of defiling the temple, they assume that he brought this efficient, a Gentile, Trophimus, into the temple, even though it was not the fact. It was just a story that they make up. When does a crowd or a community of people begin to show such a strong emotion that we have just read? You can see that there was a big commotion when they accused Paul of defiling their sacred place, the temple, by having or inviting a Gentile into that because it was not allowed. The Gentile can be in the outer court or the court of the Gentiles, but you can't go beyond that because if you go beyond that, that will be the inner court. As for inside people, it's for the Jews. And at the entrance to the inner court, there are signs being posted here in Greek and Latin where all the Romans will understand that whoever enter, non-Jews who enter that place, they will be executed. And even Roman citizens will not be spared by that. And you can see how sacred and how important that place uh, is. So what happened? What are the things that can brought such a uh, revolt, such a riot, that create mobsters trying to tear Paul apart. You can see all the commotions that were stirred up, and it talks about how they suppose that Paul brought into it, and they ran together, they seized Paul, they dragged him, and they, they want to kill him, and they were in confusion. They ran down to him, they beat him up, they shot one thing, they uproar, and uh, they, they have violence, and these are the mobs. A lot of adjectives, a lot of you know, actions they were describing about these people. It was, it was a huge commotion. There are two things that created such commotion. Let me, let me look, look at verse 28. It says, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. The people, the law, and this place is the first reason why there was such a huge revolt against whatever they assume that Paul has committed. Because this is about their identity. This is about their way of life. This is about their sacred place. See, the people, the law, and this place is their worldview. When a worldview of a community, of a group of people is being challenged, the people revolt. The people fight back. Because... Without that war veal, they don't know how to live. A war veal, it's, it's something that teaches you how to live in this world. It is a theory of the world. It answers questions like, 
Who are we? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? Who do we believe? What are important? Questions like that, that's a worldview. And these are the questions that they challenge Paul and say, this man, he is against the people, our people. He's against the law, our way of life. He's against this place, the sacredness of this place. When you challenge the worldview of people, you can expect a great revolt. Secondly, not only that, when you violate the religious practices of the community, you can expect a great revolt. As they falsely accuse him, he brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place, you can expect a huge fight back from that community. They will try to silence the messenger who challenged our, their way of life. And that's basically what happened. You know, when religious life is being threatened, emotions run high, and the Jews shut the door to the gospel. They try to silence the messenger and shut the door and to preserve their worldview and to preserve their way of life. And no wonder they were stirred up, they were charged up, they were trying to perform lynching upon Paul and to put things back to the norm. That's when they are secure, when, when they are okay. And that's the power of the gospel. Because the power of the gospel challenged our worldview. The power of the gospel challenged a self-centered worldview who lives without God, secular. The power of the gospel challenge sinners and basically say, face it up, you can't save yourself. You need a savior. No matter how much you try, how hard you try, you can't deliver yourself. You need Jesus to stand in your place, to redeem you from darkness into light. That's the only way, and you will live for him. That's a new worldview that is brought by the gospel, and that challenge all the worldviews in around the world. And you can expect a huge, huge fight back. But God protects his servants. In verses 31 to 40, we saw how God used the Romans, the soldiers, the authority to protect his servants. A tribune is equivalent to a second in command of our military today. And, uh, and, and when they say crucify him, away with him, you know, 30 years ago, in the same place, they also said crucify him to Jesus. And they were trying to eliminate Paul as a messenger who was imposing uh, or, or challenging the current worldview of the Judaism. But God protected his servant. And, and Paul was using that opportunity, actually, to try to share the gospel and speaking to the Greek, uh, speaking to the tribune and say, you know, can I, can I say something to you? Now the tribune began to know that there was a false identity, that he thought he was the Egyptians, a cultic work that drew 4,000 people against the Roman Empire, but he was not the one. Apparently he is just one of us. So he allowed Paul to address the community and address the people and trying to calm them down. And the persecution and ac accusation becomes an opportunity for God's servant to share his salvation testimony. And the witness seeks every opportunity to share the gospel. And that brings us to the second portion of the story. In chapter 22, verses 1 to 29. And that's the main thrust of the whole passage here. V chapter 22, verses 1 to 29. Let me read to you. It says, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now take, make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the street manner of the law and of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are today. I persecuted the way to the death binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them, I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who also who were there and bring them in bonds in Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light 
from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise, go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken by all the Jews who were living there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him, and he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your weakness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who kill him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him until then they raised their voice and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and clinging and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whip, Paul said to the centurion who was standing there, Is it lawful for you to flog the man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune, saying to him, what, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid. For he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. In this second portion of the passage here, Paul was given a chance to address the crowd. Paul was given a chance to make his defense uh, against the hostile audience. What do you talk about when you face a hostile audience? What is your focus? You want to start a debate? You want to start an argument? You want to challenge the worldview? You want to say that, you know, our belief is ruined, you are wrong, and start debating and fighting? No, that was not Paul's approach. Paul's approach was to be authentic. Paul's approach was to tell his life story. Paul's approach was to give a salvation testimony. Paul's approach was, let me tell you who am I. Let me show you what has happened to me. Let me tell you what have I encountered as I continue to be zealous for my faith. You know, when Paul was a faithful uh, a Judaism uh, followers, you know, he was following as closely as he can, as much as he can under those circumstances. You expect Paul to be zealous. Okay? So when he begins to share his story about his root, his upbringing, and his passion in verses 4 and 5. In verse 3, says, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia and brought up in the city and educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the street manners of the law of our fathers and being zealous for God for all of you are just like all of you are today. And to show my zealousness, I persecuted the way those who follow Jesus all the way until death. I sent them into prison. I get permission from the priest and the council of elders to give me authority to do more beyond Jerusalem. 
So I was on the way to Damascus, try to get and rope in more Christians and bring them to Jerusalem and imprison them and to punish them. Paul was exactly following the way of Judaism, the way of the law, the way to show your zealousy by being uh, fervent in the way of persecuting other faith. He was doing as exactly as he was expected. But something happened. Something happened along the way. Paul was saying to the people, I was just like you. We have the same root. We have the same upbringing. I, I was brought up in Judaism. I followed the law. And to show that I am a devoted uh, Jew, I persecuted Christians. In fact, I imprisoned them. Some were brought to death. Okay? And I continue to do that as a proof that I am following my faith by being a devoted Jew. And, and that was what he was telling the people. But something happened. That something happened. And that's why I am here today to tell you what happened that changed the course of my life. You know, when you are a Jew, believe in Judaism, wanting to follow the laws and, and the, the, the sacrifices that has been passed down from Moses to them, naturally you do according to what you believe, right? What you believe, you are. Whatever we do today is because of some convictions. Whatever activities or whatever uh, plannings that we have today, if you look at your planning and then come back and basically analyze that, you can deduce some value, some convictions from there. Because all of us operate from convictions and belief. The fact that you are here, it, it is a statement of what you believe. The fact that you do something, the fact that you have a certain priority, is because of some convictions and some values that you have embraced or has been passed on to you. That's how we operate. What you believe, you are. And Paul was acting normally as someone brought up in Judaism and yet so fervent in his faith in Judaism by expressing it in the ways that he connect with other faith and other people. It's, it's natural. And that makes me think about our faith too, right? What you believe, you are. And our church continues to remind our people of the culture that we want to cultivate together as a church. We have high view of God. We have high view of scriptures. Our pastor said it all the time, and our people said it all the time. We have high view of God and high view of scripture. Do you know what it means? When you make that statement, when you make that as you believe, do you know the implications? It's, it's wider, it's deeper than you thought. Because when you say that we have high view of God, it, it means we take God seriously. It means our faith is not half-hearted. We don't go halfway. We go all the way when we have a high view of God. It means He is the center of everything, literally everything, of my marriage, of my family, of my career, of my dreams, of my ambition, He is the center. When I say I take God seriously, it means I submit to Him. See, that is the natural course of actions that follow your conviction and your belief. Just like Paul naturally follow his conviction of someone being brought up in Judaism, and naturally he will follow the laws, he will go to the temple, he will offer sacrifices, and then he will persecute people of other faith. It's a show of his conviction of what he believes. What you believe, you are. And when we believe in the high view of God, you see the center of our schedule, our recreation, of our time management, our marriage, and our family, our budget. When we have a high view of God, it means we serve God with excellence. It is expected. When you say, I serve God, 
and I have a high view of God, and I take God seriously, I serve with excellence. I put everything in there to make it well, because that's my conviction. When you say I have high view of God, and I defer to Him, when there is a conflict of loyalty, when there is a conflict of priority, naturally He takes precedence, because I defer to Him. I have a high view of God. When I have a high view of God, I lift up Jesus above me. That is the expected follow-ups of your convictions. You see that? But if that doesn't happen, then it is just self-deception. It is. When we say that we hold to high view of God, you know what I mean? When we say that we hold high view of scriptures, it means I take God's word seriously and I do my best to live it out. Knowing that I'm not perfect, but I will do my best to live it out. And to say that I don't care about reading the Bible, I don't care about reading through the Bible, um, the pastor's preaching is good enough for me once a week, is in contrary to what you claim to be high view of scriptures. You know what I mean? And that is my concern for our church. That we make many claims. And we are good at making them. We know how to build a church who believes in the Bible and able to articulate many biblical thoughts. And yet we don't care as much to follow through in our lives. That's my concern. Because when you say high view of scriptures, you will want to read God's word. Even though you say it's hard, but you will find a way to understand it. You will subscribe to a reading through the Bible plan and program because you said that I have a high view of scriptures. See, we live by belief. If we believe in this, then naturally there's a course of action that follow, just like Paul. In his pre-Christian days, he just lived it out. But it was changed because he encountered Jesus. And when he changed ownership of his life, when he changed lordship of his life by the grace of God, Jesus came, intervened him along the way to Damascus, not to punish him, but to save him and to show him the way, the way that he used to persecute now become his way of life. That's Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now his life began to transform. And because of that change of belief, a new embrace of a new master, he begins to live accordingly. And naturally, his focus is on Jesus. And naturally, he preached about Jesus. And naturally, he proclaimed Jesus, he witnessed for Jesus, he lived for Jesus, he suffered for Jesus, and he would die for Jesus later. That's the natural course of actions when you hold on to a belief. You know, it's serious stuff. It is serious stuff. That when you say, I believe, it is very serious that when you say Jesus is my Lord, it is serious. Because there are implications to uphold that statement. There are actions that need to uphold that statement that Jesus is my Lord and Master. And today I challenge you, today I challenge you, to look at your life and my life and look at our church life who continues to pry in high view of God and scriptures and to ask ourselves, yes, that claim is biblical. That statement pleases the Lord. But we don't want just a statement. You know what? We don't want just a statement. We want to, by God's grace, to live out the life that can reflect that statement. Okay? Reflect that statement. And I think that's, a lesson I learned from
from Paul's testimony, his live testimony before a very hostile audience. It was because of Jesus. Jesus changed his life. You see how that change happened? In chapter 22, verses 4, 5, and 6, he used to say, I persecuted the way as a fervent Jew. I received authority and letter uh, from the priest in order to keep persecuting them. I was on my way to Damascus. He just lived according to Jewish way of life, a very a zealous Jew to continue his path. But when he encountered Jesus in verses 10 and 11, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? You see that change? You see that change of loyalty? What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told. All that is appointed for you to do. And verse 11 says, Since I could not see, he was blinded. In order he can see the new way. Because of the brightness of that light, he said, I was led by other people to wait for the instruction from Jesus. You see, he was the master of his own life, following the way of the Jew, persecuting Christians, he said, I was persecuting, I received letter, I journey. Now I was changed, I was blinded, I was told, I was led by Jesus. I was instructed by Jesus. You see that? Total transformation, change of ownership. His center of gravity is shifted. And that's who we are. That when Jesus came into our lives, our center of gravity shifted and Jesus became the center. And we live accordingly. When we say high view of God, when we say high view of Scripture, we need to live accordingly. Then we can really, truly claim that in our lives. Verses 28 to 20. 22 to 28, again, we saw God's protection of his messenger against flogging now. Just like the first time, he was spared by God, by the Romans' authority, uh, against persecution. Now, it's against flogging. He claimed his Roman citizenship to spare himself from being flogged because it is illegal to flog a Roman citizen before you can condemn them before you can proclaim your verdict on them. You can't do that for a Roman citizen. It's not legal. And, and Paul claimed that. So he was not afraid to use all the resources he has for the sake of being a witness of Jesus Christ. He continues to uh, uh, do whatever it takes for him to be able to proclaim the goodness of Jesus Christ. There is no... Uh, necessary to suffer when there's no need for suffering. So there's no unnecessary persecutions that Paul continues to uh, walk ahead. But he would take on uh, strongly as a witness of uh, Jesus Christ for the sake of the gospel. And when Ananias came to him and to remind him to be a witness of Jesus Christ in verse 14, he says, the God of our Father appoint you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. That's your encounter. That's when Jesus came upon you. Okay? You heard a voice, you see the righteous one, and you know his will. You know, you hear, you see. You experience Jesus. But now, in verse 15, for you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. You know, in that two short verses, it's a great definition for what is a witness. A witness is to tell exactly what you have seen and you heard and what you know. You are pretty much repeating what you know, what you see, and what you hear to the, to the other, other person or to, to a crowd of people. That's witnessing. You are not inventing a new message. You are not trying to possess 
or, or try to find a new argument, a good way to approach. When I say give your weakness, you tell the same story over and over again. It's the same story. What have you seen? What have you heard? What did you know? Same thing. So we are called to be witnesses. Not asking you to read a book on apologetics. Not asking you to just enroll in seminaries before you can be a witness. Not asking you to try to do something unattainable. When I say be a witness of Jesus Christ, the Bible is saying that just tell the same story, what you have seen, what you have heard, and what did you know. And that's your personal encounter with Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul has been doing and instructed by Ananias. Because whatever you have seen and heard and know, now tell it, show it. Let other people know you are witnessing for our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that's who we can be uh, as Paul continues to move ahead with what God is doing in his life. And let me just give you my central idea for this passage here. Your best defense in the midst of hostility is your authenticity. In the midst of hostility, when you are placed in a hostile environment, your best defense, your best defense is your authenticity. It's your life story. It's your lives living before the people. And even they still disagree with you, and even they are not convinced by your life story when you live uh, an authentic life, at least you earn the respect. At least some questions are being asked deep in their hearts and say, man, this guy or this girl has conviction. What happened? Why do they hold on so strongly in this conviction and this belief? There must be something there. I may disagree, but there is something there. At least you earn the respect of the opponents when you live a life of authenticity. So as I end this message, I just want to remind you three things. One, you and I need to take a stand. You and I need to take a stand. As many of us heard Martin Luther in the time of Reformation, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. After he posed the 95 Thesis on the door of the church against the Roman Catholic Church. And when they asked him to rescind and recant, he said, I can't do it unless you can prove from the scriptures that all this uh, is, is against the teaching of God's word. I will not withdraw. I will not take it back. This is where I stand. I can do no other because this is the truth from God's word. As a Christian church, we need to take a stand for our faith, for our belief in your marketplace, in whoever he has placed you. Uh, secondly, I want to remind our church to expect sufferings. Jesus said, I am your master, I suffer, so you, you will. Different degrees, in different forms, but uh, it seems to me, uh, it appears to me that it is increasingly, increasingly anti-Christian sentiment and environment around our country. I was very moved by a Christian testimony of a Christian in China. Uh, he was worshiping in a church, in an open church but the church was somehow uh, uh, did not receive well before the authority, and they were asked to close down. But they refused. They worshiped in the parks. They worshiped in different places. And he was one of the leaders, and he was being in prison for a few months. And when he was in a prison, uh, let me just cut it short on a certain portion that really transformed his life as he was trying to live his life for a few months in a prison. He said, so this prison stay became a special retreat for me. It revived my prayer life, renewed my zeal for the gospel, and rekindled my love for all kinds of people in this land. He said, during nap time on my duty days, I watched these strange and familiar faces. Uh, they sleep in groups in different places, taking their naps, and they appear both pathetic and lovely to me. He said, my heart went out to them in press, and a love surged out of me towards them. It was in this moment that I found myself falling in love with this place. I even had desires to stay in prison longer. A very strange way of facing suffering 
and facing imprisonment when God's love begins to work in his heart. Expect sufferings. Take a stand. And then finally, I just want to encourage our church to use every resource God has given you to be a witness. God has given you special positions in the workplace. God has given you special favor before people. God has given you special networks. Use that as witness because Paul even turned around a, a riotous situation and said, can I have a platform to tell my life story? Can I have a platform to tell my encounter with Jesus respectfully? And he was given that opportunity. Use every resource God has given you to be a witness, including exercise your rights to vote. I really, really want to encourage our people uh, not to stop voting. Uh, I know that this year the presidential election is a difficult one, and you hear all kinds of things, you know, uh, the way we vote. Um, I, I am not at a liberty to share at the pulpit here, but, you know, exercise your rights to vote. This year is an absolutely crucial year. Very, very crucial year. You have to vote. You have to pray for, before God and say, God, who is the candidate that best represents our belief, our values? You have to vote before God and say, exercise your rights to vote. And as Christians, we must pray. We must pray for our nation. You can, you can elect the best presidents, but they are affordable. You can elect the most competent leaders on the position, but nobody is spared from corrupts and lobbies and stuff like that. It's difficult to be a leader. It is difficult. So the ultimate answer is, though we need to vote, it's not to place who on there as if uh, peace will restore and everything will be okay in our nations. Ultimately, it's the church of Jesus Christ. We need to pray for our nation uh, so that our, our nation will continue to to respect God, to honor God, to fear God. And that will be the beginning of hope and revival for our nation. So let's pray together. Father, we just uh, pray that a very long passage, a uh, very limited time, and we try our best to highlight some important teachings here that our people will truly respond well to your reminder. And Father, I believe that your message to our church today is to live a life of authenticity because that is the best defense before the world, even before opposite, uh, op opposition and uh, before hostile uh, groups and environment. Lord, I, I pray that our church who keep reminding our people to hold a high view of God and high view of Scripture will also follow with the course of actions that reflect our conviction. And teach us, Lord, to receive good teaching from God's Word and also to have the determination to live out that faith and to experience transformation in our church life. Hear our prayer, Lord. Jesus, then we pray. Amen.